Let's take our Bibles this morning and open together, please, the book of 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 3, we've been studying the lives of two great, uh, two great prophets, two great men of God. The lives of Elijah and Elisha. Elijah was used mightily by God and certainly paved the way for Elijah or Elisha and the great ministry uh, that God gave him. But many victories were won at the hands of Elijah. The greatest that we, uh, that we remember as being on the top of Mount Carmel as he defeated the prophets of Baal. But we learn many lessons uh, from the lives with whom, of those from, with whom he, he ministered and interacted. Uh, the widow of Zarephath, uh, even in his personal life as he fled to Horeb and God met with him there and instructed him and encouraged his heart. But we come now and Elijah, of course, is gone. Uh, in, in 2 Kings chapter number 2, we read of how Elijah was taken up into heaven on a chariot of fire and in a great whirlwind. The man, his mantle f- fell to Elisha. And we find the first recorded miracle of Elisha in chapter 2, which was him, his healing of the waters of Jericho. Well, as we turn the page and come to, to 2 Kings chapter 3, we find another time of great upheaval in the life of the nation of Israel. Of course, Israel is divided. Uh, the, the northern uh, kingdom of Israel, its capital city is Samaria. Uh, 11, or, uh, sorry, 10 tribes fell there. Uh, two tribes uh, uh, comprise the southern kingdom of Judah, and uh, whose, whose capital is Jerusalem. I actually read of their, of their king, Jehoshaphat, uh, in chapter 3 as well. It's not the first time we've, we've heard his name referenced in our study of these two men. But now, Ahab is gone. King Ahab died. Remember, he was at the end of, of 1 Kings uh, chapter 22. We read how he was shot by an archer uh, during his battle with, with Syria, and he died. And now his son Jehoram reigned in his stead, according to 1 Kings chapter 22 and verse 50. And Jehoram was not a good man. He wasn't as terrible as his father Ahab. He did remove the, the, the image of Baal from, from, the, from the public eye in, in, in Israel, but he still continued in the ways of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who caused Israel to sin. Well, as a new king, there were, there were people who were subject to him, or, or nations who were subject to Israel. One of those nations was the nation of Moab, the country of Moab, the people of Moab. And when Ahab was alive, Moab, under their king Misha, offered to Israel 100,000 lambs, 100,000 rams with all of their wool every year. It's a lot of, that's a lot of wool, isn't it? It's a lot of sheep. Well, now that Jehoram's the king, Misha, he's starting to be strong in his mind. It's like, I'm not, I'm not going to pay that tax anymore. I will not pay that tribute. It's a, it was a test of, of Jehoram's strength. It was a test of his leadership, if you would, of his power. It was a slap in his face. And so Jehoram decided, you know what, I'm going I'm to go, I'm going to send a message down to Jerusalem, to Jehoshaphat. And I'm going to strike up an alliance, a military alliance with Jehoshaphat, again, just like my father Ahab had done. And we're going to pursue after the Moabites and get back that tax that they've withheld. Not only did Jehoram strike a league with Jehoshaphat, but he also struck a deal with the king of Edom. So now you have three kings that have, that have come together in an, uh, an alliance and they're pursuing the, the, the Moabites in the wilderness. It's a seven-day trip that they've made so far. And now they've come to the place that they don't have any water. There's no water for their soldiers and there's no water for their herds that they've brought with them to sustain their soldiers. What are they to do? If you're able this morning, I invite you to stand with me as we read together here in God's Word. 
we're going to begin reading in verse number 9. And we'll read down through verse number 14. Notice what the Bible says, 2 Kings chapter 3, beginning in verse number 9. The Bible says, So the king of Israel went, and the king of Judah, and the king of Edom, and they fetched a compass of seven days' journey, and there was no water for the host or for the cattle that followed them. And the king of Israel said, Alas, that the Lord hath called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord, that we may inquire of the Lord by him? And one of the king of Israel's servants answered and said, Here is Elisha, the son of Shaphat, which poured water on the hands of Elijah. And Jehoshaphat said, The word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. And Elisha said unto the, unto the king of Israel, What have I to do with thee? Get thee to the prophets of thy father, and to the prophets of thy mother. And the king of Israel said unto him, Nay, for the Lord hath called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. And Elisha said, As the Lord of hosts liveth, before whom I stand, surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look toward thee, nor see thee. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word of God today. And Lord, our desire this morning is that we would hear from you. Oh God, we've, we've, we've already sung and some, some wonderful hymns of our faith. And Lord, our hearts are prepared. Our desire, God, is that you would speak to us from the truth of the word of God that you'd remove distractions from our minds and from our midst today. God, that we would focus all of our attention purely upon you and your word. Father, may the Spirit of God reign in our hearts today. May the word of God, uh, may we give place to the word of God. And Lord, may you help us follow you in simple obedience. Lord, there's a great lesson in this passage. Uh, and Lord, our prayer is that you'd help me present it clearly this morning so that we could walk, a, walk away from this place today having heard from you, having been challenged and changed by the power of God. And so, Lord, we pray today that you would work in this preaching time. And Lord, again, if there's anyone here this morning who does not know Christ, our prayer is that today would be the day of their salvation. But God, we love you. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. If you're in the habit of marking things in your Bibles, I'd like to draw your attention to what the Bible says in verse number 14. Right there in the heart of the verse, we find, uh, we find really a compliment, if you would. Of course, uh, 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 these three kings, uh, Jehoram, the king of Edom, and Jehoshaphat, they've come to seek counsel from the Lord by the, by the mouth of Elisha. However, there's a problem. Elisha does not like Jehoram. Nor does he like the king of Edom. Both of them are wicked. We'll look at their lives here in just a moment. But there's a problem. They weren't right. But he looked at Jehoshaphat, and he made the statement right there in verse 14. He says, I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat. Would you mark that statement in your Bible? I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat. As we look here in this passage of Scripture this morning, I find that there's a great lesson concerning prayer. God's answer to prayer, but which we'll look at here in a moment. But as we begin this morning, I'd like for us to notice the prerequisite of prayer. Notice the word there in verse number 14. It's the word regard. My prayer for when I pray and speak to God is that He would regard me not disregard me. If you look back there in, in, in chapter 3 and verse 13, you notice what Elisha said to, jo, to, to Jehoram. He said, and Elisha said unto the king of Israel, what have I to do with thee? He said, why, why are you coming to talk to me? You've never cared for me before. You've never sought counsel from me before. Why are you here now? He says, what do I have to do with thee? 
and get thee to the prophets of thy father. Who were the prophets of his father? Well, his father was Ahab, and the prophets of his father were the prophets of Baal. The same man, or the same type of man, that, that was slain by, by Elijah back in 1 Kings when, he, when God defeated them at Mount Carmel. These were the prophets of Baal. They were the prophets of his father, and they were the prophets of his mother, who was Jezebel. Again, Jehoram was a terrible guy. He, as we, as we look, even look back in chapter 3, we notice in verse number 1, it says, Now Jehoram the son of Ahab began to reign over Israel and Samaria uh, the 18th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and reigned 12 years. And in verse 2, the Bible says, And he wrought evil in the sight of the Lord, but not like his father and like his mother, for he put away the image of Baal that his father had made. Nevertheless, he cleaved unto the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, which made Israel to sin. The Bible says he departed not therefrom. He was a terrible man. You know, sometimes he's like, well, you know, Goodness is relative, right? In comparison to, to his father Ahab, he was probably an upstanding guy. But he was still a wicked man. He was not right. As a matter of fact, we, would, we could even venture to say that he did not know God. That he had no relationship with God. Friends, one of the prerequisites of having our prayers answered is having a relationship with God. If, if you're here this morning and you don't know Christ as your Savior, God will not hear your prayer. The first prayer that He will hear from you is your prayer of repentance as you seek Him for salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. The prerequisite for, uh, for having your prayers answered, your prerequisite for God regarding you, is a relationship with Him. But there's another prerequisite. You've got to be right with God. You know, both Jehoram and the king of Edom, they were, they were strangers. You think, of, you think of Edom, you look back in the, in the Word of God, the book of Genesis, where we're, we're first introduced uh, to Edom in chapter 36 of Genesis, of course, Esau is Edom. Esau was the brother, uh, the twin brother uh, of, of Jacob. E, uh, Esau was born first, but if you remember uh, the account of their birth, Jacob reached his hand down and took hold of Esau's heel uh, as, he was, as he had been delivered. Uh, Esau was a man of the field. Esau was a man of great carnality. He was an emotional man. His flesh fueled the decisions of his life. And even the Bible says, look there in, in Genesis chapter 36, as it speaks concerning Esau, it says, Now these are the generations of Esau, who is Edom. And in verse number 8, it says, Thus dwelt Esau in Mount Seir. Esau is Edom. So it's from this man's family, from this man's life, we discover the, the Edomites. And we think of, of the rebellion of Esau's heart. You know, the Bible says, t tells us how, how he uh, despised his birthright and as he sold his birthright to Jacob for a bowl of pottage as he came from the field faint, uh, believing in his heart that he was on the brink of death. And, and he sold that. He, he despised his birthright. And then he had his his blessing stolen from, from him again by his brother Jacob in deceit. And, and in his anger and in his, the rebellion of his heart, we look back in chapter 28, and the Bible says, well, as we can even look and see in, in chapter 27, we find the intentions of, of Esau, of, I'm sorry, of Esau's parents. See, they sent Jacob away because they did not want him to marry one of the daughters of the land. 
you know, young, young people this morning understand we're not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. It's not just a New Testament truth. It's, an, it's a biblical principle that we trace from the beginning of the Bible all the way through the end of the Bible. Amen. But we find here that, that Esau despised his parents' wishes. The Bible goes on to say, uh, let's look, it says uh, in verse 46 of chapter 27 of Genesis, And Rebekah said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob take a wife of the daughters of Heth, such as these which are of the daughters of the land, what good shall my life do me? Hey, I don't want my kids to, I don't want my son to marry some heathen girl, some pagan girl that's going to draw his heart away from me. From, from, from the true living God. And so now, Esau becomes privy uh, to his parents' wishes. They, they understand that he just sent Jacob away to go find a wife in Padanaram. From the house of Laban. So what does Esau do? The Bible says, And Esau called Jacob and blessed him and charged him in, in chapter 28 and verse 1 and said unto him, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. You can't get much clearer than that. We look down in verse 8 of chapter 28 and the Bible says, And Esau, seeing that the daughters of Canaan pleased not Isaac his father, then went to Esau, I'm sorry, then went Esau, unto Ishmael, and took unto the wives of which he had Mahalalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebajoth, to be his wife. It was a rebellion. Complete rebellion. Christians, you cannot live in rebellion against God and expect God to hear your prayers. Look at what the Bible says concerning this truth in the book of Psalms. In Psalm chapter 66, please. Very familiar passage of scripture. In Psalm chapter 66, in verses 18 and 19, the Bible says, If I regard, mark that word, the word regard. Elisha would not regard Jehoram. He would not regard the king of Edom. Why? Because they were regarding something. Look at what the Bible says in verse number 18. It says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. I want God to hear and answer my prayer. Isn't that what you desire for your life this morning? When you pray, you, you, you want God to hear you. We want to have that confidence that God hears our voice, that, that He hears our prayer. Evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud, and He shall hear my voice, was the statement of David. There was an expectation but if we regard iniquity in our heart, God will not hear us. If we regard sin in our lives, God will not regard us in our prayers. So what must we do? Well, the simple answer is to get right with God. To be right with Him. To, to walk in truth, to, to walk in the light. As He is the light, we will have fellowship with Him. Our desire is that we, that we cleanse our hearts. The Bible says, oh, pure, uh, cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. The book of James. God wants you and me to be right with Him. God wants to hear and answer your prayer. Do you believe that? Look at what the Bible says. It, remaining there, in verse, in verse number 19 of Psalm 66, the Bible says, But verily God hath heard me, and hath attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, which hath not turned away my prayer, nor his mercy from me. God does not want to turn you away. God wants you to turn to him. Amen. He that cometh to God, he will in no wise cast out. 
He wants to hear your prayer. He wants to hear your voice. He wants you to share with Him the deepest needs of your life. He wants you to confide in Him. He wants you to trust Him. He wants you to ask Him for help. The Bible says He's a very present help in time of trouble. But you have to tend to the prerequisites. Do you know Him? Do you know Christ as your Savior? If you were to die today, where would you spend eternity? If there's any shadow of doubt, if there's any fraction of uncertainty in your life, then you better settle that before you leave today. You think not having your prayers answered is bad. Imagine spending eternity without Christ in a place the Bible calls hell. Friends, recognize the reality that that inevitably hardship is going to come into your life. Difficulty will rise, whether it was your doing or brought upon you by the hands of someone else. Hardship will come. Man is but a few days and full of trouble. So what will you do? To whom will you turn? Look back in first King, I'm sorry, second Kings. Chapter number 3, 2 Kings chapter 3, we find here the decision of Jehoshaphat. Was Jehoshaphat a perfect man? No. You know, he must have been like me, kind of hard-headed. Because if you look back, even in in in, uh, the end of 1 Kings, in chapter number 22, um, Ahab went to him and he... He struck a league. And in chapter 22 of 1 Kings and verse 4, the Bible says, And he said unto Jehoshaphat, Wilt thou go with me to battle to Ramoth Gilead? This is the question of Ahab to Elijah. Or I'm sorry, to Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as thou art, my people as thy people, my horses as thy horses. And you know what happened? He almost lost his life. Remember, uh, here's Jehoshaphat, he's, he's dressed like a king, he goes into battle, and the Syrians are looking to kill Ahab. I mean, that's their primary goal. He's like, we're going to kill that guy. And so they see a, see a man dressed in kingly apparel, and they pursue after him. And Jehoshaphat, he cries out, he's like, oh man, I'm not Ahab! You know, and... And so they withdraw. I mean, it almost cost him his life. And then an archer shoots and kills Ahab. But we we, we look ahead, and 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 Jehoshaphat, he's not not the sharpest guy. Obviously, I mean, we look ahead in in chapter 3, we find that he gives the same uh, same answer to Jehoram that he gave to Ahab. And recognize, I understand that there was this this uh, this Hebrew uh, sentimentality here. I mean, they were they were all children of Abraham. They were all uh, real, you know they were all family. They were the same people, but they weren't the same. They weren't the same. Jehoshaphat at least had a desire for God. Where Ahab had no, had no desire for God. Couldn't have cared less. And it was only because Jehoshaphat sought to inquire from a prophet of God that, that Jehoram even thought about it. It, was a, it, wasn't even in the, it, was, it wasn't even in the back of his mind. But look at Jehoshaphat's response in chapter 3, in verse number 7, it says, And he went and sent message to Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, saying, The king of, of, of Moab hath rebelled against me. Wilt thou go with me against Moab to battle? And he said, I will go up. Notice again, he says, I am as thou art, my people as thy people, and my horses as thy horses. He didn't learn. And it wasn't very long into this alliance that he realized that he had made a mistake. 
if Jehoshaphat would have only sought God at the beginning, he never would have got himself into the problem to begin with. Christians understand there's a, yeah, there's prerequisites, but there has to also be a priority here. What is the priority? The priority is God. God first. What does God have to say about it? What does God, well, is it God's will? Isn't that a great question? How many of you ever seek God's will for your life on a daily basis? I think we ought to, don't you? How do we discern God's will? It's His Word. Friends, if it contradicts this, it contradicts your Christian life. You ought not do it. Does it bring glory to God? If it doesn't, then you shouldn't do it. Is it helpful to your Christian life? Is it going to benefit you? You know what? Sometimes, you know, you know I, I believe we ought to be a missionary everywhere we go. We ought to try to tell people about Christ. How can, but to, the Bible says, how can two walk together except they be agreed? You can tell people about Christ, but man, you better be careful with who you're buddy-buddy with. Because evil communications corrupt good manners. I've never read a story of where a bad person was positively affected by a good person. But always the contrary. We always fall to the lowest common denominator. Friends, we have to recognize that God must be priority. And now we find Jehoshaphat in a perplexing situation. What do I do? I'm going to die. All of my men that I've just led here were seven days' journey into the wilderness. There's no water. What are we going to do? We're going to pray. We're going to seek the Lord. Christians, understand, whenever you find yourself in, in a place where, where you just don't know what to do, and may I also say, even when you think you know what you ought to do, you must always pray. You should always seek God. You must always rely upon Him. You must always, uh, you must always consort with God's Word. Seek God's leadership. Seek God's direction. Seek the peace of God to make any decision that you make. Because even a decision made with good intentions can be a terrible decision if it's not where God is explicitly leading you. We recognize the goodness and faithfulness of God. Jehoshaphat wasn't a perfect man. But I believe in my heart of hearts that he wanted to do the right thing. He wasn't just going to take a shot in the darkness now. I think he finally came to grips with his need for God. You know, this is, well, this is the second time, Lord, what are you trying to teach me? You know. I find myself in a hard place now. What, what, what's the lesson? What's the great lesson to learn? The lesson is our need for God. And our need to depend wholly upon Him. Because God hears and answers prayer. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews 11, I believe in verse 5, it says, He that cometh to God must believe that He is, that He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Do you know the Lord this morning? Do you have a relationship with Him? If you're here this morning and you know that your sins have been forgiven, and by faith you have repented of your sin and accepted Christ as your Savior, how is your relationship with Him? If you're regarding iniquity in your heart, if you're holding on to sin, if you're, if you're unwilling to let it go, what is this word iniquity? It means self-will. It's, it's what you want to do regardless of what anybody or anything else has to say about it. It's a complete disregard for God in pursuit of your selfish, sinful motives. God will not hear you. Christians, we must be right with God. It's, it's very simple. 
I'm thankful that the way back to God is very easy. I'm thankful that salvation is simple. Repentance and faith. But that having our, our sin forgiven, having our fellowship restored is also equally easy. Hold your place here in, first, in 2 Kings and turn to 1 John, if you would, please. A very familiar verse. Perhaps most all of us in the room here this morning could quote this. But in 1 John chapter 1, in verse number 9, we find with great simplicity the promise of God in restoring our personal fellowship with Him. The Bible says there in verse number 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We must confess our sin, which means to agree with God concerning that we have broken God's law and pursued only ourselves and lived in complete disregard for the Lord and the things of His Word and ask for His forgiveness. And if we agree with God, confess our sins, He promises to forgive and to cleanse, and to restore that fellowship with Him. And then, God will regard us. If we disregard that sin, God will regard us. And as we, in the intention this morning... is for God to help us grow in our confidence concerning in this matter of prayer. And that's only the introduction. I'm debating whether or not to preach the message now. It's like, Pastor, just put pack it in, right? But I'm thankful that God hears and answers prayer, aren't you? Praise the Lord. I'm thankful that God is able to meet every need of my life. And tonight, I want to encourage you to come back. Because we're going to look at the rest of the story this evening. And I want to show you some encouraging lessons regarding God hearing and answering our prayers. Because from verse 15 through verse number 25, the Lord is going to speak to Jehoshaphat through Elisha. And He's going to teach him, He's going to tell him, He's going to instruct him concerning the prayer, the petition that He's brought before him. And so oftentimes in our lives, we... We're seeking for the answer, and it's obvious. But there's a certain response each of us should have. It's a response of submission. Sanctification. Separation. See, God wants to work in your life. Do you believe that? God said, hey, I regard, I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed. In just a